Welcome to another edition uh, from the Press Box. I am Rob Leonard. Joining me is my co-host and brother, award-winning sports writer Tim Leonard. How you doing? And on the phone with us, we'll go straight, straight to the guest. This is what happens when you get a Hall of Fame baseball writer. You go yeah, right to right him. To, we, don't, we don't let him let's wait. Not, let's not He's waste not time. He's not in the green room just sipping away. He is here. Bill Madden of the New York Daily News is with us. And, Bill, welcome back to the show. This is the third time you've been on. We appreciate you coming back. No problem. Good to be here, guys. Um, I want to start off just quickly. The month of June is now over. The worst, thankfully, the worst <laughs> June ever, and this is ever for the New York Mets. Even nineteen sixty-two, yeah. I didn't even realize that. <laughs> I, I, That's uh, awful. I, what 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 happened? What happened to this team that started out eleven and one? <laughs> well, I, mean, <laughs> I guess I guess what happened was they weren't as good as they looked when they were eleven and one. <laughs> we're finding that out now. Uh, there was a there was a lot of things with this team. Um, you know, it's funny because uh, the Wilpons are always being accused of not spending money or being cheapskates. And yet, when you look back on it, the Mets have spent their share of money on players. It's just that they've had no luck with these players. True. And we can start with this year with Jay Bruce. I mean, who among us thought that the three years and $39 million for Jay Bruce was a bad deal for the Mets? In fact, most people thought they got him at a bargain. Yeah, that, that was a and, celebrated uh, contract when it was announced. Right. He had performed well for them last year, and then he uh, was traded and performed well again. And uh, it looked like this was a good pickup for them. They needed another bat in the outfield. And he's been a complete bust. Mm. And, um, you know, everybody thought that, well, if the Mets were going to have any kind of a team this year, they were going to have to stay healthy in the starting rotation. And... Ironically, they've stayed relatively healthy. I mean, Wheeler's been okay, and Matt's has been out relatively healthy. And, of course, uh, Syndergaard got that finger thing. Right. Uh, but the Grom has been a horse. And you would have thought, with the rotation being as most stable it's been in probably about three, year, three or four years, well, since the championship team, um, that they would be okay. But the team has just been a disaster. They don't play good defense. They don't play good fundamental baseball. And um, guys have just been not hitting. Conforto's been a disaster. Con- Sad to say. What they expected from him. Yep. And uh, so this is what you got. And unfortunately, uh, there's nothing coming in the farm system that could have helped them this year or next year. And so they're in a real tough situation. And. <laughs> Who would believe that they would actually be behind the Marlins in the standings? Yeah, I agree. I mean, my wow. God. Now, now, do you think the Mets will trade Jacob DeGrom? Because if, if they do, it reminds me of when they trade Seaver in 77. Yeah, well, I'm with you on that because how did that work out? Six years of four, uh, walking in the for, desert. Right. Well, they got four for, – for Seaver, they got four relatively proven players – and the key guy was Steve Henderson. They thought he was going to be a superstar, which he never was. And uh, the rest of those players were just okay. And uh, the Reds got the, even though they gave up four players for Seaver, they got the advantage of that deal. Oh, I'm always reluctant to make those kind. When you have a stud like Seaver or DeGrom, and I'll give you a good example of it, Chris Sale with the Red Sox. Mm-hmm. When the White Sox gave up Chris Sale, uh, he was clearly the best pitcher in baseball. And they got the two top prospects in the uh, Red Sox organization, Moncada and Kopech, the pitcher. And neither one of them has panned out. Kopech is still struggling at AAA. Moncada has been a major disappointment on the major league level as their second baseman. And Chris Sale is probably going to pitch the Red Sox. Uh, well, he's definitely going to pitch them into the playoffs and We'll see how far they go after that. But he, without Chris Sale, the Red Sox aren't where they are. He's still one of the top three or four pitchers in all of baseball. And so it turns out that was a bad trade for the White Sox. They didn't get enough back for him. When you're trading a proven stud like a DeGrom or a Sale or a Seaver, you better make sure you're getting back proven quality players. And, you know, I... 
other than the Yankees, who certainly could give the Mets a great package of fairly proven players for DeGrom, I don't know what, what other team out there is going to be able to give them what they need to get back for him. Because I don't like trading a DeGrom for guys at AAA that have never played in the majors, even though they have good credentials and uh, Baseball America rates them as <laughs> right. these top prospects. Prospects are prospects until they're proven. That's the way I look at it. Good point. By the way, Tom Seaver, uh, you know, it, for me as a Met fan when he was traded, it, it put me in such a depression. Um, and I, I, I've heard that you're working with him on a documentary. I am. Uh, I've been working on this for about three years now, and we're getting close to fruition on it. Uh, I have a few more interviews we have to do on it, but we're hoping to get it ready in time for the anniversary next year, the 69th anniversary, the 50th anniversary. That'd be great. Uh, I have a very close relationship with Seaver from the, all the way way back to when he was pitching, and uh, uh, I'm really excited about this. I think it's going to be a really terrific documentary so well i, I was, it was that was that a pun intended <laughs> yeah well i, I also as, as re- a matter of fact it was <laughs> <laughs> well i remember uh, a, a, a few articles ago you did do a story where you go out to visit tom and his vineyard and you're hanging out with him and you can obviously tell from the article that uh you and him have a, a pretty decent history well yeah and of course he's got the lyme disease which right. has been a really tough blow for him uh because um you wouldn't know it if you're with him, but because um, uh, he's healthy and he's he's out in the vineyard every day picking grapes or tending to his grapes and working with he's working with the vineyard workers. He's out there with them, and he's in good health. But the Lyme disease has taken up taken a major hit on his on his mind. He can't remember a certain a lot of things, and uh, he has to be helped along in that respect. And it's really it's painful for friends of his like myself who have known him for so long because he's a brilliant guy, as you all know. Yeah. Right, yeah. Uh, he's the only player I ever knew that used to do the New York Times crossword puzzles in the clubhouse <laughs> before games. Wow. Uh, that tells you a little bit about I was going to say, the only, the only other player I knew who could probably do that was Mike Messina. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, uh, so the Lyme disease has really taken a hit on him. But other than that... Uh, He's in good shape, and uh, he's still a great person to be around, and we've had a lot of fun doing this thing. I've been out there three times now for three separate sessions with him on this documentary, and um, we'll hopefully uh, have it ready to go by next summer when everybody's going to be celebrating him. Is is that going to be a documentary like for ESPN, or are we talking about, like, about, about a documentary film? It's a documentary film that could be on ESPN, could be on Netflix, could be on. We we're talking to a lot of different people about it. Nice. We haven't uh, we haven't sold it yet, but we will. Yeah, without a doubt. <laughs> I think that that I think you're going to have multiple offers on something like that. You should anyway. Well, uh, I hope so. L- let me just get back to to Degrom for one second. Um, I know you're talking about prospects, but in in your estimation. I, I've I've put this out there, and and I'm, I'm gonna have an, a different question for you after this. But would would a package that is pinned on Clint Frazier and at least two other top ten Yankee prospects would that be enough for you to get it done? Well, um, you know, I, I think you know it's funny they they. This kid, Florio, would have to be in the deal, I think. Uh, the only problem with him is that uh, he's been hurt this year. Right. And it looked like he, this kid was going to be the next coming of Willie Mays. Everybody who ever saw him said, this guy, can he's a five-tool center fielder. Uh, I'm now wondering about whether or not the hype was more than deserved for him. Uh, but he is hurt, or he has been hurt. I'm not sure what his No, he, he, yeah, he is. I, I, think, I think it's a risk. Yeah, so um, if he were uh, not hurt and still progressing the way he was last year, I would say a Florio, Frazier, and a pitcher of some, you know, maybe Sheffield, their top pitcher, that would that would be a decent package, yes. That, would, that, that gets that you would, to have the conversation. Yes, okay. exactly. But, you know, you don't know about Florio, so... 
Yeah, I mean, from what I've heard, he's got he's got some swing and miss to his game. That's that's the that's the only knock on him that I've heard. But otherwise, yeah. everything is like you said, Willie Mays. You know, I mean, he everybody has him ticketed as as the next great Yankee center fielder. Right. Well, when you talk about swing and miss, who doesn't have a swing and miss problem <laughs> these days? <laughs> well, <laughs> well, that's what I wanted to talk about. We we're talking to Bill Madden of the New York Daily News. The last two weeks, you've had some really interesting articles about what I would call the state of baseball. On the 22nd of June, you had an article uh, pointing out that there have been 18,365 hits compared to 18,815 strikeouts. Those numbers aren't supposed to be that close, are they? No. I mean, this is going to be the first year in baseball history that there's going to be more strikeouts than hits. Wow. And I'd like to tell you and that's a, uh, a freak of nature, but it's not. It's going to get worse and worse. Uh, it's been getting closer every year, and now this is the year, the tipping point year. And it's going to, from here, it's going to get worse and worse. And um, this is a real problem for baseball because there's nothing more boring or more action sucking than a strikeout, especially when there's runners on base and it's the last out of the inning. Right. Um, and we're seeing this more and more and more. And it's, the, it's a combination of reasons for this. Uh, I did some research on this because I certainly remember growing up and uh, and watching my favorite players through the years, whether it was Mantle, Mays, or Aaron, and uh, further closer to now, uh, players like Rusty Staub and and um, and um, Cepeda and McCovey and all those other guys, uh, and they didn't strike out like this, and uh, Mickey Mantle led the led the American League in strikeouts five times from 1952 to 1960. He never once came close to having more strikeouts than hits. The closest he ever came was in 1960 when he had 145 strikeouts, uh, 145 hits, and 125 strikeouts, which led the league that year. You look around baseball now, every one of these players would – Few exceptions have more strikeouts than hits right now. And um, the reason for this, I think, is twofold, uh, for, especially for the more uh, current players that come up in the last few years. They're teaching them this uppercut swing that they want to have fly balls. Ground balls are no good because ground balls can be turned into double plays or whatever. Fly balls, you have a chance of hitting the ball over the fence. And as uh, one of the analytics general managers told me a while ago, he said, when there are there are eight defenders on the field, but only three of them are in the outfield. Mm. And therefore, your odds are better of getting a hit, or even better if you hit, if you have excellent velo, uh, you can hit it out of the ballpark if you hit it in the air. So they are teaching them, these guys to swing for the fences and to swing, hit the ball in the air, and that's resulting in an inordinate amount of strikeouts. And then the other factor is what's happened to starting pitching. <laughs> You're bringing in these in – the, Mickey Mantle never had to face three straight pitchers coming into the game from the sixth inning on, different pitchers coming into the game throwing 97 miles an hour. And every team in baseball seems to have these guys. This is the way the game has changed. Yep. It's just sucking the offense out of baseball. Absolutely. And creating all these situations in baseball where there's no more action. There's no more rallies. And so There's not a lot of bunting either. There's, there, there's, just, no, there's just anticipation for a home run. I've been watching these. Uh, no, but, uh, I'm down here. In, I live in uh, Clearwater now. And I've been watching the Rays for the last few days. Um, <laughs> there's a phenomenon going on down here. You're probably aware the Rays have this new thing that they're using uh, where they're having these bullpen days in which they use five and six pitchers, six or seven pitchers sometimes right. to get them through a game. And they start the game off with their – they might start the game off with their closer, Sergio Romo, because the analytics say the first